decided I wanted to work in healthcare when I was about um, 10. And I think it was just because I just really loved people and I wanted to help people. And I think I was quite an avid watcher of casualty. So it sort of stuck with me really. There isn't anybody in my family that's a nurse, um, but it was just something I really, really wanted to do. Um, I just always wanted to care for people. And I was always sort of a carer for other people around me. Um, I've got an older brother, but I always felt like I was the older sibling. Um, so that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to do that. I was really fortunate to do my training at the University of Manchester and I was so happy when I got in there because it was one of the best universities for nursing. Um, but um, I was a bit late going to uni in the end. Things changed in my career and different things went along the way. So I, was, I didn't start till 2006. Um, my training was absolutely really beneficial and I worked in some amazing areas. Some of the training wasn't amazing, but a lot of it, I'm very thankful for and quite glad I went to Manchester University. There was quite a lot of racism and discrimination, which I wasn't overly aware of in first year maybe, but when I went on to placements, that's when I started to really notice them. Um, and sometimes it was just small things that were said to me like, um, that I should be grateful really that I've been given the opportunity to do it and different things like that. I've mainly got racism from patients probably more than staff at the time and that was just small um, microaggressions that were usually used towards me or asking me if I ate certain kinds of food like had I had yam for breakfast, um, had I ever seen snow when it snowed? I was like yes lots of snow, I live in the Peak District it's full of it. Um, so yeah, there was small microaggressions, um, but nothing as severe as, as I got, went further into my career. Experience of racism in the NHS was, it was devastating, but also embarrassing. I felt like really ashamed and I didn't know who to talk to about it. So I didn't know whether to go home and say, like somebody said this, am I being over, am I overreacting or not? Um, I did seek help and I went to speak to somebody that was higher up about it and they just dismissed it really and said I was probably being oversensitive because I was only the only person of an ethnic minority within the team at the time. Um, so then I just sort of sat with it for, for a few years till the next incident and the next incident of racism. Um, I don't know if I dealt with things a little bit better as I got, as it kept happening, race, racist incidents. Um, I think I probably shut a lot of them away as well because I didn't know how to deal with it and because of the negativity I'd received in the past from it. Um, but yeah, it changed me as a person. It took all my confidence away as a nurse because then you start to question whether you can be a nurse, whether you can do this and whether this space is right for you because everybody's telling you it's not the right space for you. When I started my first job, I was asked quite a lot of questions about my family. Um, if I had brothers and I was like, I have one brother and they actually asked me if I could, if he had what size his genitalia was because he was a, a black man. And I was like, oh, I don't really know. Um, I also had a really bad incident. I have a son who um, is also mixed race. And when I showed them a picture, they asked me, they went, oh, it's really good that he doesn't look like you and he's really fair. He'll probably have a better chance in life. And I remember feeling completely crushed. And I think for like, six weeks I wouldn't even take my child to school because I didn't want anybody to know that I was his mum because I thought, am I going to ruin his chance in life knowing that his mum is me? Um, in the end, I did end up having to take time out from work because I became quite depressed 
and I started to challenge things about myself. I didn't want to, I even went, I did get to the stage where I didn't want to be this race anymore, which I think was one of the worst stages of my life now, um, because a lot's changed since then. I'm actually really proud of who I am, but it's a shame that it got to that point that people made me feel like I can't exist in the same way as others. Um, I think a lot of help and counselling helped me to get through that, but I still feel quite angry in a way that I had to go through that because I still deserve the chance to be a nurse like my colleagues. Um, but yeah, I suppose I am grateful also for experiences because they do make us who we are in the end, but it's still awful that you have to think back to them. And certain things happen now that do trigger me to feel quite bad. Um, but I just hope that we can sort of change, I can change things by talking about my experiences and other people talking about them as well. I've had lots of experiences of um, bullying and racism within the workplace as a nurse. I've had them predominantly from members of staff that I work with, not from the public. Um, a lot of comments have been comments like if I've said, oh, I'm really tired today, or I seem to have more patience than you. I've had comments like, it beats being a slave. Um, that is pretty difficult to deal with. And when you're the only minority, there's nobody else to go to. Um, as I have often worked in whatever area I've worked in, I've worked in a team where I've always been the minority. So I haven't been able to sort of talk to others about it. I have been fortunate on one occasion that somebody did stick up for me and said, that's wrong. How could you even say that? Um, and that was a particular time where we were all going out for a really lovely team building um, experience. And a member of staff turned around to me and said, I don't want to go with you. It was a laser quest we were going to, so obviously it's dark inside. I don't want to go with you because I won't be able to see you in the dark, so you'll win. I remember just being really shocked and saying that's really inappropriate. And the ans the response to me was, but I know you, it's fine. Uh, I went home and I remember just crying all the way home in the car. And I just, it's, it's, it's not even a guilt. You feel guilty and ashamed because you shouldn't really, I felt, it's not even anger that you feel, it's just like having to go and tell somebody at home how you've been made to feel, or not being understood for how you feel. Um, and I remember thinking, I'm not gonna say anything this time, I'm not gonna do anything because I can't go through this and be told I'm being sensitive. Luckily, a member of staff had also contacted my manager that day, and my manager at the time was amazing and said like, that's not appropriate. We'll never deal with something like that. We're going to put a grievance in. Um, I was discouraged by another person of colour who worked um, in HR to do the grievance. She said, would you really want to go through that? Do you want to put the, the rest of your team through that? They could have some bitterness towards you. Um, but I still thought, no, I'm going to do it. Um, I did it and I wish I hadn't um, because I was literally interrogated at every single opportunity. I was removed from my role because the other member of staff that had said the comment, um, there wasn't a manager in to discuss it with her and they didn't want to upset her. So she was allowed to carry on doing her role and I was made to sit in an office for two months when I couldn't discuss it with anybody else in my team apart from the ones that knew what had gone on. And they kept saying to me, what's happened to Gemma? Why is she not allowed to work in the schools? Why is she not allowed to do these things? Because um, so I felt like the perpetrator and it just got worse and it went on for over a year and we knew the lady was retiring so they let her go so then there was no nothing for me I just got a letter saying on New Year's Day uh, New Year's Eve I received a letter in the post from my trust saying it was a racist we do believe it was racist um, but we will learn from this and that was it <laughs> so then you sort of feel like wow that's took a whole year. I've had to be removed from like the job I love. Um, like I'm the person that's caused problems. 
And I've also like had to question things about myself. It's also not my confidence. I don't want to go out as much because I'm scared people might judge me in a way. And it did, it did make me question again, like, should I be doing this job? Is it worth it to feel this bad? And then I'm like, but it is, it's like my vocation. I love helping people. And actually it hasn't made me bitter to everybody because actually there is a lot of lovely people out there. It's just a shame that I feel like I've dealt with people that haven't been the nicest. Um, I have become a lot more confident in calling out racism now and actually saying that's upset me or please that's a microaggression because I still hear it every day. Um, I was doing really well and then um, we I had another incident last year that was quite confidence knocking really. Um, but there's also positives that have come from that as well because obviously people are talking about things a little bit more with me. But the incident that I'm talking about was actually I was taking part in a strange, um, we were working a bit strangely because of the pandemic, so we, we weren't working in the same way we usually would. And we were working outside in the car parks in the hospital and cars were coming into seals and then we were giving the treatment then and cars were coming in with like racist things on. So we had the Confederate flag and swastikas on the car. And again, being the only person of color, I really was like, I just wanted to cry actually when I saw it. I wanted to be sick. And um, I went over to a member of staff and she went, go on then, you go to the car. And even though they were joking to me, that was like, wow, wow. I said, do you understand what it is? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, it's really, really quite racist and offensive and with everything that's going on at the, at the minute, it's so raw and awful. And they were just like, okay. Somebody else went over to the car and um, I was like, I need to go to the toilet. Just had to go and like take five minutes. And when I got back, there was n not one member of staff asked if I was okay. Um, and when I did bring it up the following day, they actually said to me, um, people are entitled to their opinions, Gemma. People can drive their cars, they can put whatever they want on their car. And I remember just thinking, I'm just gonna feel isolated forever. Am I not gonna feel isolated that I can talk about it? Um, following that, two weeks later, I was given a, almost given a disciplinary actually for not having the, for not being my usual bubbly self at work. And I, I remember feeling completely heartbroken and I still feel quite actually angry about it now because that's on my record now that I have not been bubbly enough for other members of staff were concerned about me because I wasn't my usual self but they weren't concerned enough to quite ask me how would you feeling about all this at the minute Gemma so sometimes it's a bit like I don't feel like I'm that anybody that I work with they appreciate the work I do, but maybe they don't appreciate who I am as a person because I'm really empathetic for anything that's going on in the world or for anything or anybody. And they don't sort of have the empathy for me. And it was just small comments that were being made like, oh, we can't say master bedroom anymore, can we? Because of the slaves. We can't do this anymore, can we? Because we might offend someone. And that's when you start to think, actually, yeah, things aren't really that great, are they? Because these people work with patients every day that are of, every, of different colour and um, do they get treated a bit differently? Do they think that of them as well? And do, would they say to them if they were upset, people are entitled to their own opinion? Um, so it does sometimes feel quite exhausting um, to work with people around me to sort of know that actually I don't have hold the value that they do um, because of how society is and I suppose how they've learned as well. Um, it does shock me as well that we're in 2021 and I'd like it to have changed slightly, but I've just got to keep, keep going and see the positives. I do get told I'm positive and I do try to be, but some days it is hard and some days it probably is like a, a sort of a mask you put on or body armor <laughs> in, in a way going to work. Um, but it won't stop me doing my job and it won't make me bitter towards people either.
I qualified as a nurse in 2009. It's now 2021 and I'm still a band five, which is what we start as. I did take the opportunity when I worked as a district nurse for many years to try and do a district nursing degree. I had to move a job um, just to be closer to family and things. And I was just about to start it then. Um, when I moved across and took the job, um, the team were like, yeah, there'll be lots of opportunity during my interview. Um, two weeks later, after starting that job, I was told I was only employed in that job because of my ethnicity. So I was told, you should think yourself lucky you've got this job. There was 30 other applicants and we gave it to you. And I said, well, I think that's because I've worked really hard and I had the knowledge and the skills. No, it's nothing to do with that. It's to tick the boxes. It's because of your ethnicity. I remember literally feeling completely like, um, I'm never gonna go for another job. Um, it also like, it didn't sit well with me in the fact that going for an interview as somebody of an ethnic minority is harder work anyway than going for an interview if you're white, because straight away you'll be judged. I also have privilege in the fact that my name is very British, so people might not judge me before I go for an interview. Um, but then when I go into the interview, it's like, oh. <laughs> um, so to actually psych yourself up to go for an interview, it's such a big thing. So then to be told that you've only been given that interview because and that job because of your race, it's sort of like, wow. Uh, then there became to be quite a lot of bitterness then because it was always the questions like, and I met a new member of staff the following day who was gonna sort of look after me and get me to show me around. And she was like, you're not one of these with a race card, are you? <laughs> I still don't know what a race card is. I've never seen a race card. I'd love to see it as this big, huge thing that protects you, but it doesn't. And I've, I've never used it, but that also silenced me then before I'd even, because I was too scared to say anything because no matter what, they could be quite racially awful to me and I could not say anything because they'd already put that expectation there. Um, it was also then, a, few, a month or so in, I said, do you think there'd be the opportunity for me to go back to uni to, to complete my district nursing degree? Because that's what I was going to start before I started. Um, and I just remember um, the sister that was in charge turned around and went, and she actually laughed in my face and she went, people like you do not get to wear a dark blue uniform. It's not for you. You should feel, you should, basically you should feel privileged and happy that you've been given a job because there was lots of other people that probably deserved it over you. Um, and I think that was the downward spiral because then there was just comments all the time. Um, just things like, um, you probably will get this illness because you're black. Um, it must be harder to inject your skin because it's thicker to get through. Um, different things like that. Sadly, I ended up on um, having to take medication because it really affected my mental health and things. And I remember them also saying to me, was I safe to be at work because I took medication? And I was like, well, lots of other people do. Um, if I ever did try to stand up for myself, I was then given the lovely tag of being aggressive, which is also a microaggression I get quite a lot. So then I sort of became quite mute. So I didn't want to talk. So I did my job. Um, I tried not to, I tried to fit in. I tried to change. So I'd like, I wouldn't have dreamt of having curly hair. <laughs> I wouldn't have dreamt of like having anything that was like, might offend them more. Um, and it was like, I just completely tried to whitewash myself in a way. Um, and you think you're sort of dealing with things, but I wasn't dealing with it well. And after two years, I had to go off ill. It was like it all got too much. I had to, it was like a breakdown, really. I didn't know who I was as a person anymore. And I was like, I can't be a brown person. <laughs> no way. Like, it's the world doesn't want me. Um, it, it's quite upsetting, really. Um, just because I think as a mum, you realise that you don't want your child 
to feel anything that you felt. But you also want them to be proud of who they are and where they come from. And I couldn't do that for him anymore. Um, so it I had to get help and I'm glad I got the help because it also made me realise that actually, no, I'm not giving up my career. I've fought so hard for it. I fought hard to work as a nurse and sometimes I've had to work extra hard like most of my life, so no. And when I went back to work, it was like, for two weeks, they really supported me. And they're like, we're not having any racism whatsoever. Um, but it didn't get any better. So I just had to make the decision to take a new job. And um, I took a new job and I went for an interview and I researched everything and I thought, I'm going to get this job. I'm going to ask the best questions. But I remember when they told me I got the job and for two months, I was just petrified of starting my new job. Um, because I thought, are they going to tell me again that I've only got it because of my ethnicity? Um, so I asked a member of staff when I started, who was my boss, and she actually got really upset and said, we gave you the job because of your skills and the top sort of person you are. Um, and it was just like, it was sort of a relief. But I found myself then thanking people for being nice to me and accepting me. And that's not right because I shouldn't have to, like I, I should have felt okay with being there. And um, I think I have done okay in that team, but there obviously has been the incident last year with the, the car and things. And it has left me sort of feeling a bit like I don't fit in there. Um, but it's also given me sort of like a little bit of like a surge, like actually you're going to teach these people how important it is that we're, we're an inclusive um, so there is some positives that come from it. Um, but it's hard that it still is so raw now. Um, and also the fact that I think I'm st I'm coming up for like, I think it must be 12 years. And it's quite sad that I can't, I, can, I don't think I've had a year yet where there's not been any racism as a nurse. And sometimes you just come home and you're like, I just want to do my job. I just want to care for people. and. Um, treat them in the best way I can. And I always do that. But I also want some understanding sometimes when things are like, Gemma, go and take five minutes. This must be really hard for you. It's like sometimes when you get a comment from a patient, some people, it doesn't happen to me as much in the job I do now um, because I'm so fortunate to work with young people and I just feel like young people accept us so much more and they're so they're the future and I think things are going to change so much. Um, it's not like they don't look at me and there's not like you, we don't want you to touch us or we don't want you near us. Um, and it's quite nice not to be asked every time where you're coming from, who are you, where have you come from, what country you're from, um, or what foods do I eat, and <laughs> things like that. Um, but it's just I'd like members of staff that I work with to have that understanding as well and sort of think, oh, Gemma might be feeling a bit off this week because like there's all this stuff going on in the media or, you know, maybe that's sort of made her feel a bit sad. Um, in the same way I treat some people who I know that have had certain things happen to them that I'd always say, oh, that has that sort of affected you, has it triggered you, how are you feeling at the minute? And sometimes it's just that understanding we want as well, just so you don't feel as isolated and sort of alone. Um, and also it'd just be really, really lovely to be able to go and do your job and not be like targeted sometimes or even gone like, because now I feel since COVID and the different things, it's like, sometimes it's like, we've got to make it obvious that we've got somebody of a different color in our team. So it looks like we're ticking boxes. <laughs> I've noticed I've, I'm on a lot more media now. Um, which I never used to be. So I noticed like, um, I'll be on certain pictures and that never used to happen. Um, which sometimes is really good, but also sometimes you feel like you, you're like, I'm used when I'm needed. <laughs>
But then I also think, no, because I know it's hard to be listened to. So even in my team, even when I tried to discuss how it made me feel with the car and seeing the things, they didn't want to know. It was like, that's somebody's opinion. So it's hard to be listened to and to have that voice. And sometimes I feel like that with my work. So somebody will come to me as another nurse and say, what's your opinion on that, Gemma? And I'll say, oh, well, I'd actually not do that just because the guidelines say this and as in my experience. And then I sort of hear somebody over my shoulder and they will have gone and asked another nurse who's the same level as us anyway. And you sort of think, yeah, they don't they don't trust me. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard to, to hold a value in an area where you are that minority and some people maybe aren't that understanding of you. So yeah, it just, it scares me. And also I wouldn't want to be put in a position just because of my ethnicity either. So like, wow, Gemma's, cause that would be said, wow, Gemma's suddenly a, a band eight, but that's because of her ethnicity. I don't want that. I want it because of the hard work I put in. I felt really vulnerable when COVID hit um, as the only person of a different ethnicity within our team. Um, we were, our team were one of the last teams to stop doing our job. Um, and on the day we were doing our job, we were actually on location where we go to um, treat some of our patients and our boss gave us a video call to say like, that's it now. Uh, my biggest worry was redeployment because like with any job that I go into or any role that I go into, I usually am the minority and I, because of past experience, I'm absolutely petrified of going into somewhere and somebody either making a comment or suddenly me just being like crushed because that's how it feels. You're like literally walking and it's like, boom, you know, if there's a comment made and it's just like a driftwood where you look around the room at and you're the only one. <laughs> so I was dreading it. And I was also had asked, please do not send me back to anywhere where I've had the issues. So uh, within three weeks, we found out we were being sort of redeployed to wherever we could. And obviously we all wanted to help because, you know, it was such, that's our job and we want to do the best we can. Um, but there was also the risk that we knew that more uh, black and brown people were dying as well or were catching COVID. And this was a massive worry to me. And it was also a bit of a worry to my family as well, because they were sort of like, oh, we're really worried about you. <laughs> and it was quite nice, actually, to, to have people that were concerned for you. Um, and I thought, you know, they're not going to put me on a COVID ward. Hopefully not. Or maybe they'll sort of protect me a bit more. Um, the first place they tried to redeploy me to was brilliant. And I was like, well, yes, I'll go do all. That didn't happen because they decided not to open the ward. So they tried to send me to a ward, was, which was where somebody I, where I worked before, where I'd had all the trouble, where they basically said um, that I'd only have my job because of the ethnicity and um, different things like that. So I decided um, I couldn't do it. I got so upset. I was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not willing to. I'd put that in there. So um, somebody from Staffing Solutions phoned me and basically turned around and said, okay, we've got a ward for you. It's a COVID ward. And I was like, um, have you seen my risk assessment? Um, I've got quite high risk factors. So no. And I went back to my boss who was like, usually quite understanding. Well, you're just gonna have to do what you ha have to do really. Um, so in the end, I was like, I can't do this. And I got so worked up, had panic attacks, feeling ill. Um, so I actually phoned my GP to say like, I'm really worried. Um, and he was like, yeah, your risk factors are really high. And actually, no, I don't agree with this. So he actually just signed me off work for two weeks. Um, and then all of a sudden I was just put straight back into my own team. Um, I think to keep me going to work and different things like that. And so the problem was alleviated but in a way it shouldn't have got to that it shouldn't have even been a question it had said please do not send me back to where I've had all these issues they did and please do not send me back onto a covid ward so they then tried to do that they were the two options 
Um, so it was really difficult. And I also felt like I was just hitting brick walls and I was fighting and fighting again t for like my rights as well to, to be treated um, the same as my colleagues. So like they weren't, none of them were even asked to go to a COVID ward. Um, they were given other options to do other things. And it's just things like that. You feel like, oh, it's another barrier. And why should I get my, why should I feel so, under such stress to always have to do as I'm told? Cause it's sort of like they, people have a choice, but we, we have to do as we're told and be quiet. Um, because it's like, I'm so aware that I do not want to be targeted with like being called the aggressive woman that they like to say if I stand up for myself. So I'm always in a catch-22 of trying to be assertive, but also trying to be um, non-aggressive. <laughs> and I think if most people who know me would say I'm probably the least aggressive person you could ever meet. And um, so I find it quite upsetting that it's sort of like you're silenced before you even get an opportunity to speak because you know that that's going to follow. Um, I am fortunate that I got to go back into work with my team and that our service was told that we had to carry on. But even then, um, asking for my risk assessment to be redone again was quite hard work. And it was like, we don't understand why you, it was only done two weeks ago, even though the guidelines were asking for it. Um, so I, since then I've not had another risk assessment um, and I just carried on working through COVID. Um, but obviously a little bit safer, not on a ward. But then you also, I also got things said to me negatively, like, oh, well, you lot are being all being a bit protected more, aren't you? <laughs> no, not really. Why are you all dying more? Um, because of health inequalities as well. Um, well, that doesn't associate with you, does it? Because you don't live in an area like that. And it's things like that then that you're like, you're trying to justify yourself all the time. And I, do, I sort of get to the point where I don't want to. It's exhausting. Um, but then it also made me sort of realise that I have my own value and actually I've got to look out for myself. Instead of always thinking what others might think or say, I've got to do this. And it was nice to be able to come home at night and not have to go and move away or stay away. Like that was the choice you'd have to, if you went onto this ward, you might have to live away. And I was like, I don't want to put that through for my child. He doesn't need that stress either. So it is a bit like, it's quite empowering to think that I actually was like, no, I'm not doing that. But it was awful that it also had to go down as like a sickness. <laughs> Cause then that's another thing to add to my records. Um, so yeah, it's a bit bittersweet really. We had massive issues with PPE in our trust. Um, the, we just weren't getting enough. And it was sort of like, well, what do we do? What do we come with? You've got to wear the mask. You've got to wear the um, visor, which was we were able to supply to us. Um, but it was like, what as if there isn't enough? And do I want to go to work and there not be enough? And what as if everybody's got one on and I've not got one on? Am I going to be the last one left without one? because that's how it sometimes works. Um, so yeah, I didn't always feel safe. And I also felt a bit like, is there extra tests we should be having or is there extra is there extra people you maybe we could wear? And it's like, you go to the internet then to look for things, look for advice. Um, it It's also, the PPE thing got a lot better. And we were also fortunate enough to have somebody in our team um, a boss that fought for it, like our staff won't work without it. Um, we're not cutting corners when it comes to PPE. So we did start to feel really supported. And I worked closely with somebody who was, she always made sure that there was enough for us before you get anywhere. So I had, I suppose, the privilege of actually making sure I had enough before I stepped onto to do my shift or whatever. Um, but there was still the stress and the worry of like, will we have enough next week? Cause you're still coming to work anyway. And it's like, um, difficult.
I think the most disturbing thing about during COVID was not only we were having COVID and, but when you're seeing all the data that's telling you that like more black people are dying, you start to then question the whole pan. I didn't question, I knew there was a pandemic because I was seeing people that were so poorly and there was relatives and there was people dying, but you start to question like, are oh, they trying to get rid of us? And that's a really awful thing to think, but it was like, I started to really fear, like, is there gonna be many nurses left? Is there gonna be many doctors left? They're still letting us go into those areas. They're still letting us work the long hours and they're still expecting it from us, but they're not sort of extra protecting us, even though they know we're more at risk. Um, but I couldn't talk to anyone about that at work because of me being the only minority in my team. And some of them, the people I work with, I think started to feel quite impatient with it. The other thing that happened during COVID was George Floyd. And that really scared me. Not because I didn't, because I've always known about police brutality and, and the things that happen because I've experienced different things growing up, but it was the response from other members of people that were around me, because then it was like, there's always something with you lot. So first you're more at risk in this, then somebody gets killed, but we get people that are killed all the time. And there was always, there was always questions and it was like, I wasn't allowed to sort of be. And having, feeling the way I did with the anxiety and stuff, I did get to the point where I was like, I just want to get home and be safe. Like, I don't want to really go out. I'm really scared that somebody's going to say something to me. Um, and I think I actually had to take a break from like even going on any kind of social media because I just couldn't cope with the things I was seeing. And it just, it, I felt excessively isolated, but I also felt scared, scared that like some, if something did happen to me, there'd be nothing to talk about. Like I. I wouldn't be able to tell my story or I wouldn't be able to make things a bit better before for my little boy and things. So, yeah, so it's scary. I went to management in the end because one day, obviously, somebody had said that I wasn't being myself, my usual bubbly self. Um, so management came to talk to me, which was a bit, hard because I felt like I was in trouble. I went to talk about how I was feeling about everything that was going on. Um, I said to my manager, like, I'm just nervous and I'm scared. And I know everybody is, but I'm also struggling with seeing things, um, racism on a daily basis from other people, like it's everywhere. And also explain the incident that had happened with the swastikas stickers and the Confederate flag in the car. And my boss said, I am concerned that you're not your usual self. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you to talk to a member of staff from the, the BAME network, which I'm a member of at work, um, and they can give you some mentoring. And that was really awkward because I, I don't know what was supposed to come from that. Um, so a lady phoned me, who's an executive, but of, um, who's also mixed race. And she just basically said, yeah, it's really awful what's been going on, isn't it? I was like, yeah, but it wasn't really beneficial to me. Um, and I didn't sort of understand it. And I suppose that was their guideline. Let's give them some, what they called reverse mentoring with somebody who is also the same color as you, but is maybe higher up. So they've got lots to deal with too. That's sort of how it felt like other people have got stuff to deal with too. And I'm like the most empathetic person. So I totally understand that there's a whole world that was hurting and that we were all hurting. But I think what I was trying to say to my boss is like, I'm really hurting at the minute. So I can't be bubbly all the time. And I did actually say, which I was really glad of, that I'm not actually, I don't come to work for everybody else as entertainment and actually, I do a good job of being a bubbly and happy person all the time, but actually I've got feelings too. And it's hard sometimes and seeing some things you don't expect to see. 
and seeing things can be really hurtful, but I'm always professional in my job and there'd never been any complaints from patients. So I think that hurt more because it was almost like, I did take it very personally. Um, like you can't have feelings, but you can, but we can have feelings about you and your behavior towards us because you're not making us laugh every day. Um, so yeah, then you start thinking, I had feelings about myself thinking, am I, am I too much of a people pleaser for others to fit in? And it is quite obvious that I probably am at times because I've always tried to fit in. And um, it was a bit like going on a sort of a discovery in some ways because then I was like, I'm not gonna keep doing this. I've got to just be me for me and be proud of me. Um, and I do think it's possibly changed my way of working as well in the fact like I go to work and I still give 120% but I know that I've done my best and what other people think of me doesn't matter. So what those other members of staff might think, oh, well, she, she can do a bit more extra shifts than us, or she can do that. Um, but we're not gonna take into account that she has feelings as a person too. I now just think I'm gonna go to work and do my best. I'm still gonna be a nice person, but I don't need to worry what maybe they think or don't think of me. Um, it might have made me not want to talk about things with certain people where I know that I won't get the response that I'd expect, like a positive response. I find it really upsetting, the clapping thing. Um, I don't know if it's because of the area I live in too, because I live in an area that is predominantly a white area. So we did get a lot of people clapping for you. And I remember the first few weeks I didn't want to go out to be clapped at because because of like the experience I've had, no people have always wanted to know about when you've had a racial experience because they don't always want to talk about it because they feel uncomfortable with it. So it was a bit difficult. And I remember saying to my partner, I don't really want to go and stand on the doorstep. I don't like this. I don't like sometimes people don't like nurses and I just, I felt, a. I, it was real, I can't even explain how I felt, but it, yes, it was nice to see like communities coming together and clapping and saying, yay, the NHS. But then I was also battling this, like the racism that you experience every day in the NHS and that actually I'm not a valued member of staff in this establishment. Like I don't have the same, I still don't get treated the same as other members of staff. So if somebody saw me in my uniform, would they just clap for me? Because I also found it completely upsetting that every single thing I'd see on the news, when they put nurses outside, they would never have any black or mixed nurses anywhere it, or doctors, yet you knew that they were the ones that were working so hard because you were seeing how many of them were dying, um, especially intensive care consultants. And I, I just I just battled with it really, and I'm still battling with it now um, because all of a sudden I feel as though we've gone back to sort of being disliked as nurses again, like, oh, they're just them again. It's It's not, people complain a bit more again. And I just felt like it wasn't for me because like anything, like it's changed a little bit, but when I qualified as a nurse and when you'd always see things from NMC and everything that came to you from the NMC, there was never anybody on those that was any, the nurses all looked the same. It was always that perfect nurse of what everybody had sort of made. And it, it was never anybody that was of a different ethnicity. So I still feel like we're not visible like as a as a mixed nurse, I'm still not a visible person. I'm probably more visible than in some trusts, um, but we weren't visible on the news. <laughs> we were only visible for the things like, oh, we might be dying a bit more. And now as time's gone on, we're also finding that we're visible because we're not taking the vaccines. Um, so it, does get to the point where you think, all right, we're always visible for the wrong reasons. So I did find it really hard work. 
And then when it stopped, it was like, okay, that's not too bad. But then it start, they tried to start it again. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I don't feel like the government are for me. The, the government have never sort of supported me. Um, I'm always in like, if I think of like any reports that have been written um, by the government, there is a, they're not really sort of like, I'd say they're anti me. Um, and I just feel like there was more they could have done to stop it being, to stop the numbers in our communities dying. Um, and just, I just feel like we could have been valued a little bit more. Like it would, it would have maybe have been nice to see somebody in the House of Commons and different things, or when they were talking at the Prime Minister's, like we, we always had nurses that were really high up, but there was never anybody of any ethnicity. And that, that sort of like screams that there's still something serious going on there because we weren't important enough to be delivering anything like that. Um, I think the most I saw was, I think there was a, I don't know if it was a Filipino nurse that gave the fir first COVID vaccine. And that's the first thing I've ever seen where it was something positive <laughs> during COVID. Um, so yeah, it, I don't feel like the government care too much for me as a nurse. When people say change has come, um, you sort of realise that it hasn't. And there's just still so much um, systemic racism going on. I also feel a bit like the people that I thought maybe that I worked with that I thought valued me um, don't as much. Um, just because of the comments that I'd heard or just, just the not understanding or even asking. Um, so I have found it a little bit upsetting still going to work, trying to be positive, but I still feel like, you know, there's, there's so much room for improvement and things need to change even more. Um, I'd like to say like by about, you know, by the time that my child is grown up, it might be there. But at the minute, no, we've got a massive way to go. I didn't go to any protests um, while there was protests going on. Um, I wanted to go and show the solidarity, but I still as a nurse felt like I can't because although this is so important to me, everything that's going on and the protesting and like how important it is that everybody um, gets a say and that we, that I start to matter as much as my colleagues, um, as a nurse, I was like, I can't go because like it's, it goes against everything that they're telling us to do. And I was, I was sort of scared as well. I was actually scared that then I wouldn't be allowed to go to work or they'd say to me, well, you're not coming to work because you've gone and done that because I know that that would have happened and I know that, if, that I wouldn't have probably been supported in doing it. Um, and plus I could, through social media, I could see quite a few people that I work with or have worked with saying things like, this is awful. How dare they do this? Even though you knew that people were gathering for other things and it, it, it sort of became very hurtful. Um, so the I have a BAME network at work and there was a little bit of us sort of like coming together and talking and, and sharing our experiences at first and we were able to sort of let everything out. But then it suddenly became no. It was like, oh, we're going to get some, we're going to get, people in, some other executives, so they can learn from us. And it's like, I'm a bit tired of teaching people how to, well, how to be human, <laughs> how to like accept, like make sure that we're all treated the same. I'm, I'm fed up of it. Like it shouldn't begin with me and it shouldn't, we shouldn't be having to do that because we're dealing with enough anyway. Um, Anybody that wants to be educated, I love, and it's great that they want to, but like, you have to read up things on yourself and you have to find things yourself. And the, I can only actually say that there's one member of staff that's just been amazing with me. And it was actually, um, 
her that got me to complete a survey that's led to me being able to talk about this and I'm just so grateful for her and also she's learnt so much and I do feel like I can go to somebody now um, but yeah there's we still need more During the Black Lives Matter, people didn't talk about it. And I think I found that probably worse. <laughs> I needed somebody to ask me if I was okay. And I also needed somebody to acknowledge that I was, although I'm a mixed person, I am half black. And it was like, uh, when I did try to acknowledge it, I think I got told that, but you, you're not even black. <laughs> And I think that hurts so much because I am black when people want to abuse me and I'm never white enough to be white and it hurts. And actually that's why I think it, it's just, it's very difficult, but like I'd never, I'd never go up to somebody and say, oh, are you mixed? Or, because as people, we can be light, black women or dark black women. And it's like, I know there's barriers and there is colorism and different things and I'm so aware of it. But also I just want people to actually acknowledge that I am a person of color and actually it's hurting me. And it's not just, it's all come to the forefront, but it was when people were saying things to me, it's America, What's a, we're not in America that's in America, this doesn't happen here. And I think I did stand up to one person and say, do you know, when I grew up and I was learning to drive and then when I passed my test that I couldn't go a week without being pulled by the police and I couldn't even go to certain friends' houses because the parents wouldn't then let them associate with me. So actually, yeah, I do know what it's like and it is still here and it's, I think what hurt the most is that this team that I work with, they'd known the experience I'd had in my last and I'd explained it to them and they'd always been really amazing with me. So for them to not want to to talk about it, I just sort of felt like I wasn't in the team anymore. And it has it has took its toll on me because I, I, I've sort of got to the stage where sometimes like on certain shifts I dread it because I think if something's been in the press or when the report came out, I was like, oh no, I really need to talk about it. But if somebody says something negative at work, I don't know what's, <laughs> how I'm going to react to it. Um, and it's still sort of like, you still feel like you're silenced to say things. Because if I do say something or get into a conversation, my opinions are slightly different than theirs. And like, they're allowed to have their opinions. But yeah, I'd probably say during the George Floyd thing, there was an awful lot of gaslighting going on where it's like, well, it can't be that bad. Or what about other people that kill all the time? And it was like, and he was a criminal. And that's, I think, what really hurt because I was like, we're the most caring people. And like, if somebody came to, not that we work in A&E anymore, but if you did, if somebody came in to A&E and they needed a life-saving treatment, we're going to give it them no matter what, well, I am. And even if that person had like the worst criminal record and they just committed the worst crime or murdered somebody, it's not my right to say you can't have that treatment, but it's okay for them to say, actually deserve to die because he'd done these things in the past. And it's things like that, that then you realize actually, yeah, we're not quite there, are we? Where we're quite equal. So, yeah. I think my proudest thing is that, um, like, probably that I remember my little boy when he was about three, I've still got it at work, it's a, like something and it says, my mum does the best job in the world. And it's because he's proud of me, that makes me feel um, like I'm doing something right. Um, I'd probably say the proudest thing was getting through uni and qualifying because I think I had too many odds stacked against me that I wouldn't. So to actually like get your cap and gown on and be able to like say I've done it, it's, that's one of my proudest. And I think another proud thing was stepping away from the job that was so toxic 
after going back and my proudest was getting a new job and still being able to care. But the, the thing that I'm most proud of is that some people get really bitter when people are awful to them. And it's just made me kinder because I don't want anyone to ever feel like I felt. So if I can make a change or like every single person, a patient that comes to me as an individual and they'll always be treated as an individual, they'll never be judged. And I just hope that there's more people still out there doing this job because that's what it's all about. Um, so yeah, I think I'm just proud that it's not changed me as a person, um, that I still love people and I still want to give the best care I can. Um, so yeah, that's what, and that I'm still a nurse, that I'm still doing this. Like how many times I've thought I shouldn't, I'm still doing it. Um, that keeps me proud every day. The future of the NHS would look like for me that like, um, when I went into, when I, wherever I moved through trusts and different things that like, I won't be the minority anymore. That would be so nice to see like consultant, like I know I see consultants sometimes, but I don't ever see, there isn't enough nurses. There isn't in higher up roles, um, in executive roles. I'd love to keep seeing things like that. So there's more people to go to, to understand. And I'd like to, Sometimes I think it helps to share our stories too, because some people don't always understand the struggles we've gone through. Some people just think that we've always been in this job and it's always been all right, or we've chosen to do this job. And it might not be the direction we plan to go in. Like I probably didn't plan to go into the direction I've gone into in my nurse. And I had, when I qualified, I had all these dreams of things and it was like, oh, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna work here. And I've not followed that route. And I've probably gone a bit off, third off, but, it just would be nice to see more different people in higher roles and be able to go, wow, you've done that, you know. And it's not just because of your ethnicity, it's because you deserve to be in that role and you're doing an amazing job. That would be so lovely to see. And just to maybe see more nurses still enjoying being a nurse because I feel like sometimes nurses get to the stage where they just do it because it's their career. I won't carry on being a nurse if I can't give the love and care that I do. Um, so I'd like to think that most nurses are doing it because they have so much passion and it's their vocation, like it is for me. Um, that is what the perfect NHS would probably look like to me anyway. <laughs>